daily life is to open this book. It is the encyclopedia of life. How many are old enough to remember encyclopedia salesmen? I'm an encyclopedia salesman tonight. This is the encyclopedia of life. And uh, it's full of nuggets of truth that when you hear anointed preachers and teachers rightly divide the word of truth, oh my word, it inspires you. It lifts you to new heights. It gives you new horizons of understanding, dimensions and depth about eternity and God and where you fit into the purpose and plan of God. And it's a powerful thing. Amen. And I'd like to, for a few moments tonight, on this wonderful Friday night in beautiful rolling hills of Northeast Ohio. Amen. This is God. This is God's country. That, that's what that is. This is God's country. And uh, I'm reading from Matthew chapter 6, and uh, Jesus, you know, was amazing in his instructions. He's, he's in the process of giving what people call the Beatitudes. He, he, he gave a, a, a kind of a, a suggestion on some things to pray about uh, when he gave the what is known popularly as the Lord's Prayer, and he, he's telling them, don't repeat your prayers as the heathen do. And so they turned around and repeated the whole thing and have been for decades and centuries. And uh, people don't know what they're dealing with when they handle the Word of God. But <clears throat> he also gave many observations about uh, things and about people. Uh, in his amazing, uh, his amazing, uh, searching, probing teaching, and uh, I would like for you to notice uh, in Matthew chapter six, uh, if you will notice verse twenty-one of Matthew six, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye; if therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. And that's talking about uh, the focus, the single focus unto the Lord and unto the things of God, and your whole body will be full of light. And we that do that have discovered we are full of this marvelous light. But if that I be evil, if you take in too many things from uh, the world, and it's a two-way street, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? No man can serve two masters, for he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You can't serve God and mammon. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Your life is more important than the tangible things you put in it and on it. Before the fowls of the air, they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? A lot of us would like to have added height. And a lot of us did add weight. Uh, but, but, you know, when it comes to certain things, you can't change. And uh, which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. And then uh, verse 32 says this, For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. I, I don't get the impression that many of us have missed many meals. 
the Lord helps us and provides for us. So uh, all these things the Gentiles seek after. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. We got enough trouble in today and getting through today than to worry about what's coming tomorrow. I want to preach a different kind of message tonight, kind of a different title. It's just simply a, a Jewish message, a Jewish message, and a Gentile heart in a modern world. A Jewish message and a Gentile heart in a modern world. Lord bless you. You may be seated. I don't think I need to tell you tonight that there, our world is kind of being turned upside down. Uh, the strangest, weirdest, most bizarre craziness and insanity. You know, people think the word insanity entails someone who is just mentally crazy, and it does, but but there's also an insanity that very educated people have. Uh, it, it doesn't always have to do with knowledge or lack of knowledge. If you're insane, you're just insane. One of the most brilliant people that ever lived, a master orator, and perhaps the most powerful leader as far as uh, getting people to follow him in the history of the world, was a complete insane lunatic. His name was Adolf Hitler. <clears throat> and he was completely insane. Uh, 90% of college professors nowadays either profess very little uh, acknowledgement of God or they're agnostic or they're just plain atheist. Many religious ministers have confessed that they are agnostic or atheist. And they don't believe anything about the Bible. And so <clears throat> what it amounts to is that uh, people are confused by these things. And uh, uh, just, you know, when you're a, a simple person that's looking to spend time with the, the supreme being and the, the superior uh, intelligence that created all things, uh, the Bible refers to him as the Lord of hosts, uh, the creator of the earth. Uh, he is the king of kings. Uh, he is the everlasting father. He is the sovereign of all things. And we, when we just want to spend time with him, you have to wade through all of this conflict. And, and it's in a nation that at one time was very God-fearing. In fact, the whole reason America was founded was because people had discovered when the Bible was translated into uh, their common language and they read about the real God of the Bible from these scripts and scriptures that we hold in our hand and they're so available today, which they weren't back then, they realized that the God of the Bible was far different than what the religious leaders were saying he was. Hallelujah. And so it, uh, uh, it, it became a, a, a situation where uh, they, they had to have freedom for their soul. If your soul is not free, you're not free. Your soul has to be free. And it's something that is within you. It's an entity that God put there. And it craves a fellowship with its creator and its maker. Hallelujah. In fact, uh, the whole reason behind true spiritual worship is the fact uh, that we turn our uh, 
orchestration of our praise and worship to God over to our soul. And when you do that, the body and the rest of the being that you have follows the soul. So that when you see people up here getting excited and waving their hands and clapping their hands and opening their mouth like those young people were and, and just literally bursting forth with praise to God, this is the soul reaching out to its creator and the body is just kind of following behind it and following its lead. It's an orchestration of sound and praise to God by the billowing, the billowing burst of lungs and breath that create the praise through the oral cavity of the tongue and the teeth, giving words, articulation, and saying, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I love you, Savior. Hallelujah. It's an orchestrated chorus of sound that the soul gives forth to praise its God. And in, in light of that, uh, we are people who have, because of this discovery of this dynamic relationship between the human being and its God, and, and found out that there is actually a personal experience that you can have with God. We have explored the pages of the book, and we found that it was written uh, primarily by Jewish authors, uh, people, Jewish people that writ, uh, wrote the Word of God thousands of years ago that knew nothing about what we call today the Holy Ghost. They, they, they didn't know what baptism in Jesus' name was. Uh, they didn't know what speaking with tongues was. Uh, I, Isaiah said, what for with uh, uh, stammering lips and another tongue shall I speak to this people to whom he said, this is the rest wherewith ye shall cause the weary to rest. Hallelujah. Uh, Joel said, in the last day, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Hallelujah. And so what happens is, uh, when you come into contact with the church, you're just a raw, crude Gentile that doesn't know which came first, the chicken or the egg. You don't know if there's a God or there's not a God. Today's young people hear nothing about God in school, hear nothing about God, uh, many of them from home. Uh, they don't know anything about God, and that's why the suicide rate is skyrocketing off the charts, because they have no purpose. Without God, you have no purpose. With God, you have a purpose. You have a drive. You, you have a reason to live. And you have a reason to wake up every morning. And there is a thrill and there is an excitement about knowing who he is. And that you can discover more about him. Hallelujah. And so these Jewish writers wrote all this thing and they introduced this language to us. So we came in. We were Gentiles uh, that were caught up in a world that's just, you know, all about tangible things. We, we used to uh, gather around the dinner table, never gave a thought about thanking the Lord for our food, uh, never thanking the Lord for our clothes, never thanking the Lord uh, for the breath that we breathe, uh, never thanking the Lord for the shelter over our heads. Uh, he, he gave us everything, everything, everything. He gives you everything, everything, everything. He provides everything, everything, and nobody gives him any praise in the Gentile world. And we got a nation that used to be God-fearing, God-acknowledging, God-worshipping, and now they call you a cult if you even refer to God. Well, I got news for them. They better get used to it because there's more people rising up to give God the glory than ever before, and we have come to let them know we're not going anywhere. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so uh, we, we, we came to God. We, we found out that there, there was a God uh, that, that knows the end from the beginning. In fact, uh, the prophets wrote of him. And uh, in, in the book of Isaiah, for, for instance, 
uh, there are so many things that, that refer to the, the greatness of God. Uh, for instance, in Isaiah 46, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do my pleasure. I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I am the Lord God. I am the Lord God who doeth all things. Hallelujah. Thus saith the Lord thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb. I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. I am that God. I am that God. I am that creator. Hallelujah. We learn names like Elohim, uh, El Shaddai, El Yon. We learn the descriptions of him. Rose of Sharon, Lily of the Valley, Bright and Morning Star, Water of Life, Bread of Life, the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega. I am the Lord Jehovah that createth all things. We learn, we heard, and we discovered this God is personal to us. He is a person that loves our person. He is one that made us from a part of himself. Self, we belong to him. We are the sheep of his pasture. Therefore, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. We discovered that we were Gentiles discovering a Jewish message that, that had no timeline, that was endless in its perpetuity endless uh, in its future impact. Uh, right now, we're hearing all of these amazing, amazing pronouncements by uh, our own Pentagon, the, the military leadership of our own forces saying that there, there is actually a, a national security threat uh, from uh, the uh, UFOs that they are seeing in so many places now. And, and they're coming uh, more clean and more clear about things that they have seen, and they're worried about it. Ezekiel, in the first chapter of his book, describes exactly what the radar of today's modern technology is seeing with these darting, lightning, fast objects uh, that move uh, through air uh, so much faster, almost so fast the eye can't follow them. Uh, Ezekiel saw them and said it was the wheel in the middle of the wheel. Hallelujah. It was some kind of a ship, some kind of an object. Uh, I'm here to tell you, God's in control of all of that. Uh, it's a part of end time prophecy. Uh, it's a part of of things uh, that are being fulfilled we know nothing about. NASA has released recently uh, a, a recording of sounds coming from a black hole that is uh, 226 uh, light million years away from us and, and there are groanings and moanings that are coming out of that black hole. They had to amplify it up from 57 octaves below the lowest octave that the human ear can audially pick up. They had to amplify it that much for us to hear it. It is the weirdest sound you've ever heard. And the Bible talks about outer darkness. Jesus talked about a hell that he wanted nobody to go to. And the only reason it's there is for the devil and his angels. He has no desire for us to go to hell. None whatsoever, but we decide to because he gave us free moral choice. God sends nobody to hell. You send yourself to hell by ignoring his word and not obeying his commandments. Hallelujah. Listen here. He is the absolute God that created us. He created our design. He knows what fulfills us. He knows what brings us joy. He knows how to save us. He knows how to deliver us. We are absolutely sitting with the 
fingertips of heaven in front of us. And all we got to do is grab the Jewish message with our Gentile heart and say, God, I was ignorant in the past, but I see you are everything. You are the beginning. You are the end. It's the whole matter of, of actually educating ignorant people to the things of God. That, that's why so many Bible studies are popping up everywhere. Uh, people are hungry for the things of God. And, and they are wanting to know more and more about God. Because the more you know about God, the more a reason to live that you have the more of a reason you have to be in his eternal presence. Our life in this world is just a snap of the fingers. It's just a few score years if we're lucky, and then it's over with. Where are you going? Where do you go after that? You're just going to leave that up to chance? You're just going to leave that up to well, whatever it is? No. There, that, this life is not life. This is an existence. Life is in his presence, in his fullness of joy, in the eternities that he has made for us. That's life. That's life. And it's, it's taking place in a modern world, is taking place in a world that makes fun of the things of God. When you take a stand for God in, in today's world, you can, you can expect some ridicule at the workplace. You can expect some ridicule and poking fun from neighbors. You, you'll run into that. It's, it's, uh, they don't understand. They, they are blind Gentiles. That, that don't understand what's going on. They don't realize it. In fact, uh, when uh, I, I met Brother Pecan tonight, and uh, my mind went back to those revival, that revival crusade in Buchanan, West Virginia, back in 1982, and uh, the amazing things that took place there. Professors were filled with the Holy Ghost. Uh, students were filled with the Holy Ghost. It swept that campus. And my father and I preached, and on the last night, there was a spectacular move of God. 600 people filed into that auditorium and that university. And uh, by the time the service was over with, there were students, faculty in the altar, and uh, one of them was a young lady named Sarah. Sarah was down in the altar worshiping God. Her mother was a Catholic from Pennsylvania, and she had come uh, to rescue her daughter from this cult. In fact, Brother Pecan kind of had a similar experience, came to rescue that girl from this cult she was involved in. But the mother had a severe problem. She had been born deaf in one ear. She couldn't hear. Nothing. Never could. Just one ear worked. And, and she was furious. She saw her daughter down there with her hands up. And that Gentile heart looked at that and said, oh, that's terrible. You see, don't forget the guy named uh, uh, Paul the Apostle or the Apostle Paul was Saul of Tarsus that killed all the apostolics he could before God slammed him on the road to Damascus. God has to knock you flat to get you to open up your understanding of who he really is. So here she went. She came tearing down that aisle. I, in fact, I remember seeing her coming, and I could tell she wasn't coming to pray. She had an angry look on her face. Halfway down the aisle, she stopped. She just stopped and, 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 and kind, of, kind of teetered back and forth a little bit. And, and, and she looked around, and, and she kept doing this to her ear. And this is before we knew what was wrong with her. She kept doing that. What had happened is the Holy Ghost healed her ear opened it up completely, and it was so loud, it threw her off balance, and she was staggering around. And so some of the ladies went over to kind of talk to her, find out what was going on, and, and it dawned on her, just like it did Saul, it, it dawned on her that God had intervened in her life. She was coming to rescue her daughter, and she got rescued. She wrote this letter. 
she wrote this letter to us, and I've got that letter. It said, I came to rescue my daughter from the cult, and the rescuer got rescued. She said, God miraculously opened my ear so I could hear. She said, I could not believe that a miracle took place while I am trying to retrieve my daughter from the clutches of people who I thought were crazy. Oh, my friend, the Bible says God chose the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. The base things, things you don't understand, simple things. Hallelujah. He didn't pick uh, some great learned uh, uh, professor of the law in those days uh, from the Sanhedrin to preach on the day of Pentecost. He preached an old redneck uh, fisherman by the name of Peter who had a, a big mouth and a red neck and uh, he always stuck his foot in his mouth. He picked him to preach one of the greatest messages the world ever heard and it turned the world upside down. People found on the day of Pentecost, they no longer had to go to the temple. They no longer had to have a high priest represent them. They no longer had to go through the ceremonial rituals of the law. They could come boldly right into the presence of God, just like we do today. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's, it's, a, it's a powerful amazing revelation that God brings to pass in your life when you with humility pick up this book and, and begin to read who the Lord is, what he can do. Hallelujah. Uh, Isaiah said, one shall say, I am the Lord's. Another shall call himself by the name of Jacob. Another shall subscribe with his hand unto the Lord and, and a, by a surname of the name of Israel. People will pick all kinds of names and labels to put on themselves. Those labels aren't important. What's important is you identifying with the reality of the spiritual nature of God. Hallelujah. While he was here in the flesh, ladies and gentlemen, you couldn't have him or Find him or experience him in the power of his spirit. But when he left, he sent the spirit in his place. So we could lift our hands and the glory of God from the heavens would fill us to overflowing. Shake us to our very foundations. And set us free from sin and from ourselves. It's, it's a story that absolutely will bring us directly into the power of his spirit, into the power of his name. It, it has to do with our worship. It has to do with our praise. Uh, when, when David heard that uh, the ark was coming back to Israel, uh, he took off his robes. He took off his uh, royal refinery, his his glistening garments threw him down and he just kind of kind of had his long johns on so to speak in modern terms and he danced out there before the Lord and praised God and his carnal wife looked out the window and and made fun of him and ridiculing him because he had undignified himself so much. Let me tell you something, folks. When the breath of God hits you, it will take your dignity away, and you won't care about your dignity. You won't care about your sophistication. You won't care about your self-esteem. All you want is the kiss of the presence of God. Upon your soul. In his presence is fullness of joy. Hallelujah. You see this man over here? He's doing a good job with what he's doing. But he can backslide doing that. Ushers can backslide taking up the offering. Judas was the treasure. He backslid right in Jesus' discipleship. Doing the work of God. 
he backslid because he was not tied to the Lord with his soul in his praise and worship. You see, when you come into contact with the real spirit of the living God, friend, it gets a hold of you. Hallelujah. When that presence falls down on you and begins to drip down you with that spiritual anointing, it turns you into a, a spiritual force of desire. Something bubbles up from your soul. The Bible says it shall be in you, uh, in you a well of living water springing up into everlasting life. That's the explosion of your soul to worship God. Hallelujah. There's just no dignity in that. And, I, and I'm going to tell you something. Uh, when you uh, were born, you had no dignity. How many remember when you were born? Of course not. But your aunt and your uncle and your mom and your dad told you, you came out of that womb and your hands were everywhere. You were kicking and screaming. And that's what they wanted to see because you were alive. Those are the signs of life. Hallelujah. This is, this is not craziness. This means we're alive. Hallelujah. He touched me. He touched me. He pushed himself onto me. He gave me an embrace. Hallelujah. He breathed on me. I'm alive in his presence. Oh, hallelujah. Gentile heart. Finding a Jewish message. That has become the message of the apostolic church. God opened the door to the Gentile people worldwide when he poured out the same power on, on Cornelius' house in the 10th chapter of Acts. They received the same power, the same revelation of God. And the Gentiles ever since then have been flooding into church houses and worship places to find their personal experience with this God. He is invisible. He is immortal. Hallelujah. He is in us all. He is through us all. In him we live and have our being. And he is not far from any one of us if we would happily would seek after him and find him. Hallelujah. Just put your hands out a little bit and you'll feel the heat of the glory of God in the atmosphere of praise. Hallelujah. And that's why I said earlier, the more you praise him, the more you feel him. The the more you worship him, the closer he gets. Hallelujah. The deeper you get into it, the deeper he gets into you. Hallelujah. He is the almighty. He is the satisfying portion. Well, what's going on in the world? Well, read your Bible. It's the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel. Well, we don't know what the 70th week of Daniel is. Well, it's the great tribulation. It's the last day judgment. The world knows something's bad wrong. There's all kind of Gentile people that have not been in any way exposed to the Word of God. They're asking churches, pastors. We get calls from many people saying, well, what's going on in the world? We don't, we don't understand. We don't understand. And, and they're Gentiles that know nothing about God who knows the end from the beginning and the beginning from the end. He was the God that revealed himself uh, to Abraham. He is the God that revealed himself to Moses. He is the God that revealed himself to Ezekiel. He is the God that received himself uh, unto Malachi. He is the God that revealed himself unto Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Peter. Hallelujah. He's the God that revealed himself to people throughout the ages. Uh, he is the God that poured out his spirit on the day of Pentecost. He is the God that revealed himself unto you, unto you and your children, uh, and all those that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Yeah, hallelujah. hallelujah. The church is a people that are addicted to a Jewish ancient message that talks about the things from the beginning until the very end of time. And we're living, we're living on a bubble that's going to burst. And we're living in the last throes. In fact, in fact, 
from the days of Cornelius' house until today, approximately 2,000 years. And in that period of time, God has put his word in to the actually forefront of the world so that almost anybody anywhere can get a, a Bible, the word of God, discover the truth about the living God. Hallelujah. Man likes to make him into images like into four-footed beast and flying things. He's not a bird in a stained glass window. He's not some little ornament at the end of a chain. He's not a dead man hanging on a cross. That's not God. He's not an old man with a long beard sitting on a rocking chair on the edge of space. That's not God. God is a real living spiritual entity that is absolutely attracted to the praise that comes out of your mouth. You're one of the most powerful people in your community because you have access to the glory of God. God and the literal direct contact with God through your own faith and worship in Him. People need to thank God they know who you are. Hallelujah. And it's getting reports of people getting the Holy Ghost in almost every category uh, of workplaces and occupations and church situations. I, I mean, every kind of religious group is experiencing a powerful outbursts of the Holy Ghost. And it's exciting to be a part of that because the Lord's gathering people together before he comes. Before he comes. Brother Thomas comes to assist us in worship at the end of this service. I want you to know that the Lord could come at any time. He could come at any time. He gave us a little appetizer alert with 911. He allowed the enemy to strike. It sent shockwaves everywhere. It changed our whole world. It changed the way everybody behaves. It changed all procedures, all regulations. The world's never been the same. It was like, this is what you can expect in the future. Then he gave us another space of years. He could have come then. In fact, a lot of people thought that was the end of the world. And it's coming. If you're not ready, you'll be living in a world that if you think this world is bad now, it's a picnic compared to what's coming. The Bible says that the seven sealed book will be open. The seven vials of the wrath of God will be poured out. It, it will be beyond hell on earth. And if you miss the coming of the Lord, you will have missed everything. And, and it will just be because of maybe a little vanity, a little procrastination. You got too much Gentile heart in you. You got too much Gentile sludge in your brain. You don't realize the immediate urgency to be right with God. As we come to close this service tonight, there, there's there's people here. You have a you have a real need to get closer to God and. There are people here that are working for God that need more, more power in your endeavors for God. It, whatever it is, God can meet you tonight. And he can infuse himself into you. Hallelujah. He can breathe upon you a whole new dimension of energy, life, freedom. I want to be free from myself. The devil likes nothing than to burden you down with the burdens of life and the troubles of life so that you just, oh, I'm just so down. Oh, get off of that. Open up your mouth and lift up your hands. 
kick back your head and, and let the praises flow out and let the Spirit of God pour down into you, strengthen you beyond what you can imagine. As you stand with us tonight, He is in this place. Your goodness, the Spirit and your is mighty. And it's a causes me Woo! to say, Lord, you're worthy of, of the highest yes. praise. Oh. Lord, you're 